one. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for being with us. And now I'm going to give the microphone over to Misty Rebeck. All right. Thank you, Senator. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us for Fighting for Justice in West Virginia. We're going to go ahead and let folks join our webinar. So if you're in West Virginia tonight, um, you are going to be able to uh, ask questions and interact with each other. So as you're joining, uh, you'll look at the bottom of your screen. There's a chat section. Just really encouraging folks to go ahead and throw your name in there, say hello. We would love to know where you're from um, in, in West Virginia. And also throughout the throughout the program, after the panelists sort of share their stories and talk about what we're doing here today, you'll have an opportunity to also ask your questions. Um, so there's also a, a, a button down at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. And if you give us your name and where you're from in West Virginia and a question related to what we've been talking about, we'll get you in the queue. Um, so you can go ahead and do that throughout the program so that we'll try to line up and get as many questions as we can answered. Uh, so I'm going to say welcome again to those who are just joining. Uh, you are joining the webinar and the Fighting for Justice in West Virginia Town Hall with Senator Sanders and Paula Jean, who's running for Senate. We're about to get started. Um, just again, as a reminder, there's a chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We'd love to hear um, where you're from. Hi from Ripley, West Virginia. We have Debbie from Charlestown. Uh, we have Amber from Dunbar. Hello, welcome. And all of you who are tuning in from all across the country, thank you for joining us. We're focusing on West Virginia tonight um, and we have a great panel set up for you. Uh, so as you're joining, please say hello. We love to see where folks are from. Um, and we have lots of people coming in right now. I have a love you, Paula. So we have some big Paula fans joining us. Susan from Augusta. Um, people, uh, Julie from Charleston. Okay, well, welcome. And again, just as a reminder, as we're going through the program, we will try to take some questions at the end of the, uh, the panel. So if you have a question, please just submit them through the Q&A. Uh, give us your name, where you're from in West Virginia, and a question, and we'll try to, try to get those answered for you. With that, I think we're going to go ahead and kick off our town hall tonight. Uh, we are so excited to have panelists from West Virginia joining us and candidate running for Senate, Paula Jean. Uh, uh, Senator Sanders has endorsed her, and we're going to get to learn more about her vision. But first, we're going to start um, with Senator Sanders. So, Senator, it's, it's to you. Thank you very much, Misty. And let me thank Paula Jean and uh, her co-workers for helping uh, to put this uh, live stream on the air. Uh, I wish very much, I love West Virginia. You have a beautiful, beautiful state and I visited it a number of times and I so much wish uh, that I could be with you today in West Virginia, but obviously everybody knows the world has changed with this pandemic and we just have to do uh, the best that we can. Uh, what this live stream is about is hearing from Paula Jean and other people in West Virginia about what is really going on uh, in our country today. Uh, and the truth is that in West Virginia, uh, in my state of Vermont and all over this country, people are hurting in a way that we have never hurt in a hundred years. Uh, we are dealing with the worst pandemic, which has now claimed over 160,000 lives, the worst pandemic since the Spanish flu of 1918. We're looking at a major economic collapse, the likes of which we have not seen since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Uh, and the reality of that is that in West Virginia, in Vermont, there are tens and tens and tens of thousands of people who have lost their jobs. People who have never been unemployed in their lives are unemployed right now. Small businesses going out of business. Uh, we're looking at people when they lose their jobs are losing their health insurance. And they are scared to death about not being able to afford to go to a doctor uh, for them, maybe for their kids right now. Uh, we're looking at people who are literally worried about not being able to feed their kids. 
because if you don't have any income, you don't have any money in the bank, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to go out and buy the groceries that you need. And in West Virginia and all over this country, people by the millions are worried about being evicted from their apartments or losing their homes because they just don't have enough money to pay the rent or to pay their mortgages. That is the reality that we're in right now. And on top of that, of course, we have children not going to school, parents not knowing whether it's a good idea or not to send their kids to school and on and on it goes. So what we are trying to do this evening, and we've done it just earlier today in Kentucky and we'll do it around the country, is hear the stories, the real life stories of people who are struggling. And the demand that we have is that short term, short term right now, the United States Congress has got to respond to the pain and the fear that so many of our people are experiencing. What does that mean? It means is that I think most of you know, a number of months ago, Congress did the right thing. Didn't do everything I wanted by any means, but it passed legislation of over $3 trillion, which made sure that if you out there lost your job, in addition to your normal unemployment benefits, you would get $600 a week. That's no small thing. And on top of that, uh, what Congress did is say, we're gonna give you a, a one-time check of $1,200 per person and $500 for your children. And on top of that, we're gonna prevent evictions and we're gonna provide substantial amounts of help to hospitals and to cities and to states and to help small businesses retain their employees, et cetera, et cetera. A lot in that bill. And that bill helped a lot of people during these very, very difficult times. And then what happened about three and a half months ago, as I recall, the US House did the right thing, run by Democrats. But the House said, look, this pandemic is not getting any better. Workers are still hurting. They are still without jobs. They're still without income. Uh, and we've got to help them. And what the House did is pass something called the HEROES Bill, which continued that $600 check supplement that people were getting, <clears throat> which continued the $1,200 check per person, which helped small businesses, which provided health care for those people who lost their jobs and massive amounts of money for cities and towns who today are struggling economically and who have laid off over a million workers in the last number of months. So. I don't agree with everything that was in the House bill. I would have done things differently, but at least it was a very serious attempt to recognize the pain that people are experiencing in Vermont, in West Virginia, and all over this country. And then the House did what it did. You would have thought that the United States Senate would respond accordingly, or maybe say, well, you know, we agree with you here, we disagree with you there. Let's talk about how we go forward. But the truth is that the Republican-led Senate did nothing. Week after week, month after month, everybody knew when the $600 supplement uh, was gonna end. They knew when the $1,200 were gonna end. They knew when the help for the cities and the states was gonna end, healthcare was gonna, everyone knew it. But the Senate did nothing. And finally, you know, in the last few weeks, uh, the Senate Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell uh, basically walked away from the negotiations uh, with the House, and he left that uh, to uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin and uh, Chief of Staff uh, Mark Meadows. And they basically said, no, we are not going to continue the $600. We're not going to provide what the working people of this country need. And then Trump came up with some phony executive orders, which at best, I don't even know if they're gonna be implemented because you all know Trump, he says one thing, but doesn't really mean uh, that it's truthful. At best, $300 a week for the next five weeks. I'm not sure because this is kind of a new program that the states will be able to even implement that. Uh, no money, no uh, eviction prevention. People will still be able to be evicted. No money for nutrition. Uh, no money uh, 
for uh, uh, one-time payments uh, for families, no money for cities, for hospitals, for states, uh, basically doing virtually nothing to help working people. And what we are trying to do around the country is to put pressure on Republican senators in West Virginia and elsewhere to say, you cannot ignore the pain that is going on in your state, that what Trump did was nowhere near what has to be done, that we need to maintain that $600 uh, supplement for unemployment. We need to get those $1,200 or more checks out to people. And that we have got to make sure that people in America are not going hungry. Now, on top of all of that, it's important to understand that not only do we have to respond short term, we have got to respond long term. And that is create a government, and I know Paula Jean understands this, create a government and a nation that represents all of the people and not just the wealthy and the 1%. And that means we have got to raise wages in America. I know in West Virginia, you got people who are working, you know, for starvation wages where you can't make it on eight or nine bucks an hour. And that's why we're going to raise that minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. It's why in America, we have to join the rest of the industrialized world and guarantee health care to all people as a human right through Medicare for all. It means that we have to make public colleges and universities tuition free, that we've got to deal with the existential threat of climate change, that we have to create millions of jobs rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure because people need work right now. So short term, what we've got to do is demand that the Congress, and right now, especially the Senate, do the right thing and stop ignoring the pain of so many workers who have lost their jobs and are struggling. Long term, we need to take on the wealthy and the powerful and create a government that works for all of us. So with that, I am delighted to introduce um, a young woman who is doing a wonderful, wonderful job in West Virginia in bringing working people together in the fight uh, for justice. So please uh, join me in welcoming, welcoming uh, Paula Jean Swearingen. Paula Jean, thanks so much. Thank you, Senator Sanders. And I, I just wanna take a minute and say, thank you for being a true public servant. Um, we have seen across the aisle that people don't stand up and fight for people. And you're a senator from Vermont, and you've been to West Virginia several times um, in the front lines of our communities, even when it was an election cycle, just because you cared. And we need more of that. And that's why I am running for the United States Senate is because of the plight of what my state is going through. I don't want to go too much in my story because we've got some important topics to talk about, but I want to talk a minute about myself and why I got to the place that I am. I am a poor coal miner's daughter and granddaughter. I've lived the boom and bust of the industry. My grandfather was in uh, the coal mines for 45 years. He's a proud uh, UMWA member and he served in Korea. My dad served in Vietnam. He was a coal miner. He died of cancer at 52 years old because he was exposed to Agent Orange and he was he had black lung. And that's been the fate of a lot of my family members. And I feel like I've been to more funerals than family reunions and that's the reality for a lot of people in West Virginia. This is one of the sickest and poorest states in the nation. A lot of people in this state don't have adequate sewage systems. A lot of the people in this state don't have something as basic as a clean glass of water. Many of our communities, uh, a lot of people live in impoverished conditions comparable to a third, third world country and they have cardboard for windows. And we have seen an uprising in West Virginia and we've seen an uprising in nationwide and that uh, it contributes a lot to you, Senator Sanders, to create a movement and a government that's going to be for the people and by the people instead of corporations and lobbyists. We had 93 candidates um, in our primary to that are ordinary people like myself here in West Virginia to swear off corporate and corporate PAC dollars and rise up and say that we're not going to take it anymore. 43 of those candidates got through their primaries. On a national level with people that I've been working with, we've just seen my colleague Corey Bush get through her primary and she's going to Congress. It's amazing that we see ordinary people rise up. The reason 
that I decided to run for United States Senate again is the very reason of what's going on with this pandemic, is we need true representation in Congress. Thank you, Senator Sanders, for your good presidential run, but we know the work is not done, and you need allies in the Senate, and the people need allies in the Senate. It doesn't matter what your party affiliation is. At the end of the day, these people are supposed to be serving us and working for us, and every decision they make should be coming to us and not just special interests, and that's why I got in this battle again, and I'm really, really proud of my state right now. Every Democratic nominee for the United States Senate is a woman. Every Democratic nominee for the United States, I mean, for the Congress is a woman. Every woman is, every one of them are progressive and every single one of them has sworn off corporate pie dollars. Here in West Virginia, I think we're underestimated. We unite no matter what, no matter what our party affiliation is and women especially. And I think that our state has been abused so much that women are coming out kicking and screaming out of the belly of the beast and out of every part of the state where everybody feels like they're forgotten. And we have four women right now that are ready to bust the halls of Congress wide open and make sure that we have true people servants. And right now with what's going on with this pandemic in our state, we have been proven to be one of the most vulnerable states in the nation because of this pandemic. Our governor decided to open up our state because of population, because our population is 1.8 million. We have a large elderly population in our state. We have a lot of sick people um, that are dealing with black lung, cardiovascular disease, cancer, asthma, uh, diabetes. Um, just because the Industrial Revolution was built on the backs of West Virginians and industry left us breadcrumbs, and it's time for us to have a plan B. Coal mining is not coming back, whether you agree with it or not, and we need a just transition. And that's why I'm here is to fight for economic diversity for my state. Um, we are dealing with one of the largest addiction epidemics in the country. We lead in drug overdose right now, and we need long-term recovery systems, and we need people fighting for our communities. And most of our state is on Medicare, Medicaid already. So that's why I advocate for Medicare for all. Um, a lot of our small businesses have, have closed during this pandemic, but they were closing their doors already because they were having a hard time sur to surviving and that ties into economic diversity. And if uh, small businesses don't have to carry the burden of high premiums for their employees, they can put that money back into their business. But right now, what's happening in West Virginia is the same old narrative that we have heard from a lot of our incumbents. Let's just open up West Virginia. Those people don't have no teeth, no shoes, no brains, and we're treated like collateral damage. And it's time for that to end. And it's time right now, even when what we're looking at what's going on with Congress, it's unacceptable that we don't take care of the most vulnerable in our society. And West Virginia is one of those states. When people turn on their light switch, this nation has been powered by the blood of Appalachians. And we should not be collateral damage during an international pandemic. And we can take care of our people. We can have a healthy, we can make sure in Congress that people have a healthy stimulus instead of trying to take unemployment benefits from hardworking people in the state that were already working two and three jobs already. Nobody sent the National Guard out to check on people in food deserts that don't have rural transportation and they have nothing but a dollar general to go to. It's just unacceptable. And I stand with you, Senator Sanders, and I'm, I'm sitting on this panel right now to let Shelly Moore Capito know that's why this coal miner daughter is coming after her job, because she's a mother and grandmother. She was the first woman to be elected into the United States Senate to represent the state of West Virginia, and she has never represented us. And it's time that West Virginians grow for a change. We deserve, it's not, we, we deserve to be treated like normal human beings. And like I said before, we are sick and tired of being collateral damage, and West Virginians are fighting back. Well, Jean, thank you very much. Um, and I look forward to working with you uh, and to welcoming you into the United States Senate. Uh, Paula, are you or am I going to introduce our panelists? Um, well, I've got the notes up about their biographies. If you want me to, I'll go ahead and introduce them. Our next um, one of our panelists, which I'm really excited about this panel. Um, we have uh, oftentimes here in West Virginia, we we are in the front lines of our communities, we are solving our problems while we're being ignored for, from the people that are supposed to represent us. And um, when I was approached about this panel, I'm really excited about these folks because these folks have been working really hard in the front lines of our communities. 
Um, the first is Rusty Williams. I'm sure you know him already. Oh, Senator. I know Rusty, yeah. Yep. Um, he's a lifelong resident of Kanawha County. He's a cancer survivor and he has turned into an advocate for Medicare for all patients' rights. He has proudly served um, as a patient advocate on the West Virginia Medical Cannabis Advisory Board since the inception in 2017. And it actually is currently a candidate for West Virginia House of Delegates in the 35th District. Um, he has been involved in videos with you since 2018. And he's also, you also mentioned in your book, but I want to say this one thing about Rusty too. His opponents in the primary raised around fifty thousand dollars, and Rusty run his won his primary with around fifty two hundred dollars. And I want to thank Rusty personally for working so hard for our state and doing everything that he's done for us. Thank you, Paula, for that introduction. That was. That was awesome. Uh, thank you, Senator Sanders, for uh, facilitating this. And um, I just, I, I feel, even though we are in a nightmare situation with COVID, um, I'm feeling hopeful. One of the things that uh, both Senator Sanders and Paula Jean touched on, West Virginia, we were one of the most, we're one of the most economically depressed states in the country. And West Virginians had it hard long before this, uh, this pandemic showed up. And now um, that we are, we're facing an unprecedented situation. We have patients and folks all across the state that um, I can't put into words exactly how much they are hurting. Um, for example, I hear from patients all the time. Um, from the time I got involved in, in fighting for patients and for fighting to end the prohibition of medical cannabis, Patients, I feel like they reach out to me because maybe they think it's safer to talk to me than some of their lawmakers who have um, shown absolutely no interest in listening to them. And some of the stories that I'm hearing, um, they'll break your heart. Um, one of my friends, actually, someone that I've known since I was a teenager, was diagnosed with colon cancer right at the beginning of this pandemic. And, you know, he was forced to stop working because of the chemotherapy treatments and now, um, you know, he's, he's having to fight unemployment. He, he filed at the beginning of April, he's going through chemo and he has no, no resources at his disposal. To me, um, in the richest country in the history of the world, this is just, this is unacceptable. Um, what we are doing to patients and to, you know, everyday working West Virginians and everyday working Americans, it's just unacceptable. And I look at it as a direct failure of our leadership. Um, when the CARES Act was passed and the $1.25 billion was sent to West Virginia to help these struggling small businesses and to help patients get through this, um, to my knowledge, only 3% of those funds have been distributed so far. Um, you know, we've got folks who are, just, are struggling just to keep the lights on and to keep food on the table. And, you know, um, our Republican governor wants to use those funds to fix the potholes. You know, um, and to me, this is all, um, it's, it's, just a, a total lack of um, judgment and it's showing us exactly how jacked up our priorities are. You know, um, one thing about COVID, it has put a spotlight on all of the inadequacies of the status quo. And whether we're talking about um, healthcare being tethered to employment, whether we're talking about the fact that West Virginians are working for $8.75 an hour, um, you know, this has shown exactly what we need to fix and, and, and the things that we need to do moving forward. I'm firm and I'm a huge supporter of Medicare for all. Nobody should ever have to beg for health care. Um, no working person should ever have to wonder whether or not they're going to be able to afford to keep the lights on and to keep food on the table. So these problems, um, you know, they have to be addressed both at the national and the state level. And I'm apologizing, touched on it here. I, I'm excited to say that all of our congressional candidates on the Democratic side, um, you know, we've got Natalie, Natalie Klein in the first district, we've got um, Kathy Kunkel in the second and Hillary Turner in the third. They're all progressive. Um, they all support Medicare for all. They all support raising the minimum wage. Um, Paula Jean, of course, has been a champion of all of these issues her entire, um, her entire career in activism. So I am, I'm, I'm encouraged and I'm hopeful that, you know, we can put the right people in office, but we, we're going to have to elect folks that have the right set of priorities. And if you're not prioritizing doing what is best for the people in your state that are hurting the most, then you don't deserve to hold public office in my eyes. So um, again, thank you, Senator Sanders, for allowing me to participate on this panel. Thank you, Paula Jean, for facilitating this meeting. And, um, you know, I'm just, 
I, I'm happy to be here. I'll be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Um, and, you know, as far as my run, this is exactly why I decided to run for office in the first place. After I experienced all of the nightmares uh, with our for-profit healthcare system and basically had to beg for the, uh, the coverage to save my life, I've seen exactly um, how bad this can be for folks. And I've dedicated my entire life to making sure that anyone that finds themselves in the position that I was in doesn't have to go through that nightmare. So um, thank you again for, for advocating for, for Medicare for All and thank you for advocating for West Virginians though uh, you know you represent Vermont. I mean, that's, that to me, that's huge, so. Thank you. Thank you, Rusty. Hmm. So if you want me to, uh, do you have anything else to say or do you want me to move on to James, Senator? Why don't we move on and then we'll take questions in a few minutes. All right, so uh, James has given me a, lot, a long laundry list of credentials, so it's going to take me a minute, but he's someone that I deeply, deeply admire. Um, he lives in the Eastern Panhandle, and he's doing a lot of great work there with addiction and a lot of other things. James is a Vietnam veteran, and thank you for your service, James, and he's a peer recovery support specialist um, with CCAR, credentialed extensive living lived experience to addiction. He's actually been in recovery um, for over 9,000 days now. Congratulations, James. And he's also a Black Lives Matter um, activist. He is, uh, works with GRACE, which is the Greater Resource and Community Empowerment Blue Ridge Resource Center. And he's also the board of directors for Habitat for Humanity in the Eastern Panhandle, the United Way in the Eastern Panhandle, and Spiritual Warriors Outreach Ministry. He's also a juvenile drug court mentor and also an adult a dr adult drug court recovery coach, and he is the co-host of Talk Radio WRNR 107.5, The Red Hot Coach, and the host of radio of a radio podcast called Recovery Enlightened Radio.org. It's E-L-I, I mispronounced that, E-N-L-I-G-H-T-E-N-R-A-D-I-O.org if anybody ever wants to listen to his podcast. Thank you. Thank you for that, Paula, and Light Radio. So that's my three minutes right there. Right? <laughs> I could talk, talk about everything, but I'm going to try to spread it out and kind of talk like a radio DJ so I can get it all in. But uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Paula for inviting me, and uh, thank you so much, Senator Sanders, for always showing up with that heavy bag of truth that you must carry throughout your campaigns and advocacy and you know, the truth gets to be very heavy and it's very lonely at the top sometimes. So, yeah, so I started uh, shooting heroin into my veins at age 14 in uh, Newark, New Jersey. And, uh, you know, I kept that up. Uh, I was in Newark, New Jersey, just six or seven rides. And then the army showed up and um, the army came into my life at age 17. I spent a year in Fort Bliss, Texas and where I was shipped off at age 18 to a place called Quan Loi, South Vietnam. And I spent the next 15 months there uh, where I just indulged in so much heroin and other drug activity and also a lot of violence in my life uh, as a Vietnam veteran. But I had a purpose when I was there. Uh, however, uh, coming up against the racism and, the, and all the other activities that permitted uh, prevented me from, you know, seeking a career in the military. Uh, actually, it just discouraged me. And uh, after three years of trials and tribulations in the military, I got out. Um, by the age of 20, I was out of the Army. And by the age of 21, I was in prison in Virginia for heroin distribution, which was kind of exacerbated by my service to my country. Uh, but um, strangely enough, I found myself after you know, looking back over my life, when I went to prison that first time, I was very comfortable because I had come out of a violent environment, uh, you know, as a soldier. Uh, but I'd like to add that I am a honorably discharged veteran. I, and I like to say that because I realize now that um, my, my um, career or, or my affiliation with all the substances uh, brought me to this place for such a time as this so that I can advocate for those who cannot advocate for themselves. And um, I was introduced in, when I moved to West Virginia as a veteran. I met uh, Senator Unger and, uh, and I was telling him my story. And he said, James, you know the way out. And so you need to talk to other people. We need to get you credentialed 
and uh, you can, you know, kind of advocate for these people. And so I started volunteering um, because, like I said, when I when I came from Vietnam and um, I, I, I did heroin for almost three decades. And now I've been my disease has been in remission for over 9000 days. And I like to say it like that because then it gives me a lot of time and a lot of things to talk about with my recoveries and people who and families who are seeking treatment. Um, you know, I, I have de developed some very thick skin over the years and gotten a lot of insight after I got clean and sober. But while I was in that recidivism uh, cycle and while I was a commodity for a private prison and while I was a, a, a paycheck for a lot of parole and probation officers and court appointed attorneys, uh, you know, when all the dust cleared and I'm still here, uh, I realized that my station in life has a lot to do with my past. And I always say to my recoveries is that the backstory is the best story. Paula Jean, your backstory is the best story. That is the thing that made me gravitate towards your campaign. And I love the idea that the Heroes Act, I, I just, I even like that word hero because I'm standing before you considering myself a hero especially in light of all the opposition that I've come up against over these last, I don't know, over 9,000 days. Um, but I realized that the opposite of addiction is not total abstinence. The opposite of addiction is connections, connected to health care, to connected to a quality of life, uh, connected to your family, connected to community, connected to or things like um, harm reduction, and you know, and I and I found out in West Virginia, it, it's just it's so easy to get addicted to substances, uh, opioids, and to stay that way because you become marketable. There, well, James, what I want to do now, uh, yes, it's okay with Paula Jean. So I want to hear the next panelist, and I want to come back to you because obviously your experience with heroin. Uh, is enormously important given, as Paula Jean just mentioned, the terrible addiction uh, that exists, uh, problems that exist in West Virginia. So I want to come back to that, but let me, let's take a break and move to the next panelist, if that's okay. All right. Okay, okay so uh, Sandra, we're moving along to um, Casey Provence. She is um, the HOPWA Residential Resource Coordinator coordinator for uh, West Virginia Covenant House. Um, she's a domestic involved with a domestic violence support group called Eve Ending Violence Through Education, facilitator for the YMCA. She works with domestic violent, domestic violent victims and their families. She also works in the housing population of the people diagnosed with HIV and AIDS in the southern 22 counties. Um, of West Virginia to end to prevent homelessness. She also works with and around substance abuse and treatment programs. Um, she's worked in areas of social services since graduating from West Virginia State University with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice, social studies, and victimization. Um, thank you so much, Cassie, for coming in and giving us input on what's going on on the ground out there. Hi, uh, hello. I wanna thank everybody for having me here. Um, it's my first time ever doing anything like this, but I am extremely passionate about my jobs. Um, helping the the type of people that I do is is a little different than um, than I guess talking politics all day. I literally every day, all day long, I'm with uh, either someone who has HIV and AIDS, and I'm helping them house them. I've handled about since this pandemic, a little over 25 eviction notices that shouldn't been handed out that were handed out. Um, same thing with my DV group. Um, their their biggest fear is being put out of their homes that we, this is my support group, that we have already put them in. We've already rehoused them, got them safe, got them jobs, and now they lost their jobs and they're on unemployment. And their unemployment has now the $600 is gone. So now they can't afford them places that we just put them. 
And without the, any extra money coming in, I mean, yeah, we've got a little bit, but like um, Paula Jean said before, only 3% of that has even been distributed to our programs here in West Virginia. It, it's, it's looking kind of, kind of rough for us to, to pull it all off. Um, we don't want, you know, there was the eviction stoppage. You couldn't write eviction notices. You couldn't go through with it. Well, they pulled that the same, about the same time that they did the unemployment. Mm -hmm. So what they did was, is a lot of West Virginians stayed home because they were told to, and they didn't ask for help. And now instead of getting one month behind, now they're three months behind and coming to ask for help. Average rent is five fifty. Three months is fifteen hundred, sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars. Real easy. That's a lot of money coming from programs who haven't got their their money yet, haven't got their stimulus package, haven't got their CARES Act package. There's there's even more things like with our DV victims, we have people. You know, we have a, a shelter that I ran for two years, and now I just facilitate the classes because I run the Hopper program. But we we have seen people. And these 16 people, if we get one kid that has a fever for two days, we have to put them in a hotel for 14 days. That's not cheap. We have one big fundraiser called Girls Night Out for this one shelter, and we can't do it because it's not, you can't go out. You can't have now. So now we changed it to online, and it's Girls Night In, and it's, it's big, and we're still going to make some money of it. But that profit, that handles almost 20% of our actual money that we use to rehouse victims, to send them safely somewhere else, to change victims' names, to change victims' social security numbers so we can hide them from people. Like, this is affecting everyday people at all times. This isn't, I mean, yes, this three, five months that we've been in this pandemic, but it was longer than that. We needed money way before that. Now we just need 10 times more. DV has rose 20% since the stay home order, order has raised because of stressors of money, because of being in each other's space, because of drugs. Our, a lot of our DV is because of our, our opioid pandemic and our DV goes hand in with the people who are going to programs. I can't get my victim into a program right now because there's barely any open. So I can't even get her started in her healing because there's no programs to get her feeling okay that where she can actually be okay to do so. You know what I mean? There's, we have waiting lists for almost every program because we don't have the funds to keep them all open. We have um, waiting lists for every DV shelter in West Virginia. We have 14 programs. There's not any openings. We don't have the money to, to put people other places ongoing especially if we have to continue to to keep these people safe in this vulnerable community so safe that we're corn that we're quarantining these people for 14 days in hotels that are giving us discounted rates they're doing what they can but they have to stay afloat too so it all just kind of comes together that the heroes act would completely push us you know where we need to be um, oh, well, let me take back completely. We'll definitely be a good art to push us where we need to be and, and, and help because right now the people who are, who are struggling the most in real life without the pandemic are struggling 50 times more right now. Well, well uh, let me just jump in and say, Cassie, um, thank you so much uh, for what uh, you have done and, and, and the work you're doing. I, I can't even begin to think how difficult it is, how stressful it is, and it can, all, of the, it can get all of the problems and the tragedies you see every day. And uh, and let me thank James for his work with, uh, boy, people who are dealing with addiction. What a terrible illness that is. And and Rusty dealing with people who are struggling uh, to find uh, health care. So thank you all very much for being with us. Uh, what I would suggest now, Paul Jean, is maybe. Uh, Missy, do we have anybody uh, who would like to ask any any questions? Yep, we have we have a lot of questions, sir. Do you want me to jump into a few? Yeah, why don't we? Uh, if that's okay with folks. Let's do that. Okay. Um, this question comes from Ellen from Morganstown. Uh, with more people working from home, education being transitioned to online learning, and the increased use of telemedicine, what is the plan to increase access? Afford affordable access to quality internet service? Well, and that is a great question. Um, and we didn't touch it here, but uh, my guess would be that in West Virginia, as is the case in Vermont and all over this country, there are a lot of people, A, 
who don't have the kind of computers they need, and B, they don't have internet service because it is either inaccessible or it is much too expensive. So what some of us are fighting for is universal access uh, and high quality broadband service, high quality and affordable cell phone service as well. And this is not only important for individuals and for students, it's important for the business community because I don't know how you open a business in a town if you don't have a decent quality broadband uh, or cell phone service. Uh, this is one of the issues, by the way, that we are trying to deal with in a new piece of legislation, which we are fighting to get done in the United States Senate, putting billions of dollars to expanding affordable broadband, quality broadband service all over the country. Great, let's just go to the next question. Um, this is really relevant. So this comes from Stephen from Charleston, Charleston, excuse me. What are our options as the USPS, as the USPS faces these challenging times? As an employee and a proud member of the community is hard feeling so helpless as a blatant dismantling occurs around me. Well, I, I don't wanna do the one answering all the questions. It was this kind of a congressional uh, response. So let me just say a few words. Anybody else wants to jump in, please do. Um, I am a strong, strong proponent of the United States Postal Service. I've spent my life fighting against the privatization of the Postal Service because it's terribly important that regardless of what your income is, where you live, whether you're on Park Avenue in New York or some dirt road in West Virginia, that you get served and you get mail delivered to you every single day. Um, what is going on right now and what Donald Trump just told us the other day, very simply, he is trying to defund and in my view, destroy the postal service because he does not want, this is what he said. He does not want people to be able to send in, uh, mail-in ballots. Doesn't want you to be able to vote by mail. And if you destroy the postal service, you're not going to be able to do that. I suspect that he thinks that if we can make it impossible for millions of people to vote and we have a lower voter turnout, he may be able to win the election. This is just so anti-democratic. It is so horrific. It's hard to believe that a president would be trying to do that, trying essentially to destroy the ability of people to participate in the political process. Telling people you got a choice. You could either go into a polling place and risk your health or maybe your life, or you don't vote at all. That is not what, you know, James is a, a veteran. He served uh, Paula Jean's uh, father and grandfather of veterans. People fought and died to protect American democracy and that we have a president who's trying to undermine that democracy and destroy the post office is unbelievable. So what I would say to Stephen is we're doing everything that we can in every way to make sure that the Postal Service is adequately funded and that you and everybody else in this country uh, can vote by mail if that's what you choose to do. I'd like to add something to the end of that, if I may, Senator. Yes. Um, yes. I'd just like to say um, to the gentleman that asked the question is just vote. Get everybody in your building to vote and get everybody on your block to vote no to Donald Trump. I concur with that 100%. Okay, uh, Miss Lee, we have another question. Sure. This question comes from Jesse from Gilbert, West Virginia. The question is, what is your plan to end the opioid epidemic that is killing people in our area? Well, you know what I'm going to do with that one? I'm going to, I have some thoughts on it, but I'm not the expert here. Uh, we have somebody who is dealing with uh, addiction, uh, maybe more than one person. So why don't we give it over to James? James, why don't you briefly give us some ideas what the United States Congress can do to address the opioid epidemic in West Virginia and in fact, in many other states around the country. We can do one thing very simple and very quickly. We can make a seat at the table for those people who have struggled and survived addiction and find out what it is that those people did and then enact those things that 
help people to seek long-term recovery, get in long-term recovery and stay there. After rehab, then what? There needs to be a complete overhaul of the, of the system, the way that the care is delivered. Um, because right now, all, everybody who continues to be addicted to substances, opioids, illegal drugs, they become a commodity for prisons. So if we can get that message, I think the education of the country around opioid addiction and to you know, bring us to the table, nothing Good. about us without us. Very important point. Paula Jean, did you or, or Cassie or Rusty or anybody else want to uh, add to what James said? Yeah, I do, Senator. This is um, uh, actually a very important topic to me. Um, I don't know West Virginia that's not been impacted by addiction. So I've spent a lot of time with folks like James and other people on the front lines of our communities to figure out how to solve this problem. And one of the biggest issues is, of course, you know, we had a lot of opioids shipped into um, a lot of small communities and that, that should have never happened. And there's some preventative measures that are preventing from that happening right now. But also we have to get rid of the stigma addiction of addiction first. Um, I know 80 year old women that uh, trusted their medical providers and went into for hip surgery and they came out addicts because they trusted their medical provider. But the thing that we need the most is long-term recovery systems. Drug replacement therapy plays a vital role. And it seems like because of a lot of our incumbents are funded by big pharma. Their, their vision is only tunneled back into drug replacement therapy. And I've heard from a lot of people that are in recovery, they do not want to take one drug and place it with another drug. Long-term recovery systems work, um, but they need support um, on a state level and a federal level for funding. They need support of social workers. They need support, or support of medical providers. And that's also, also ties into Medicare for All in, during this uh, pandemic right now, we already led in drug over, overdose deaths in the country. Those um, numbers have increased since this pandemic because people have been waiting to get into long-term recovery centers and they're not available. They need to be in every on every corner where uh, people are dealing with this pandemic. And right now, you know, we're dealing with several crises here. We're dealing with water. Uh, water crisis, we are dealing with uh, the addiction as well as this pandemic and poverty and all those things. But um, also too, we have to make sure that people have a true path to be in protective parts of society. A lot of addicts have faced criminal charges and if they can't even get a job in fast food and, and being part of their recovery when they get out and being part of the vital part of their uh, vital parts of um, society once they get out and that's part of the recovery system, then, then we fail. And like James said, give people a seat at the table. I think so many West Virginians feel like they're not heard. And, and there's people like James and all kinds of leaders across the state are trying to really hard to implement long-term recovery systems and the funding is just not there for it. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Paul Jean. Um, Ms. Lee, we got more? Sure. Um, the next one that I'm going to uh, pick is from Mason. Mason asks, what are the first steps in transitioning to renewable energy without hurting the coal miners of West Virginia? Mason comes from Morgantown, West Virginia. Um, Paula Jean, you want to take a shot at that one? Yeah, actually I do. Um, right now, uh, there is no just, just transition. We had over 170,000 coal mine, 140,000 coal miners in the 1970s, and we have less than 50,000 nationwide. And one of the biggest and cruelest lies that a politician can tell is coal is going to rebound because it's not. And we have not had any anybody that's, uh, in, a lot of our incumbents that are not visionaries for our future it's been proven that uh, renewables are viable here. We have hot spots for geothermal. Um, this is the birthplace of rivers. We could use our dams for hydropower. Um, we could grow hemp on mountain tarp removal sites. If we legalize cannabis, we would see economic growth within six to eight months. If we had comprehensive broadband, good roads, good schools and infrastructure, we would invite business here. But there is no just transition. Coal miners are starving. 
and they deserve to have good jobs as well as our educators, our nurses, our teachers, our doctors, um, our state employees, everyone deserves a good job. But right now, we don't have a plan B here in West Virginia. And that's one of the reasons that I run for office is because people are dying and starving and we can't put our eggs in one basket anymore. Um, that can't happen for us. Um, we've seen what it has done to our state, and a lot of our people are having to leave, leave our state because, and find work elsewhere, especially a lot of our children, and a lot of people just want to come back home. It seems like we come 48th and 49th and 50th an opportunity, but we never get there because people are not there for us. They're for corporations and lobbyists, and they've not taken care of our communities and our state. Okay, thank you. Ms. Lee? Next question is from Matthew, um, also from Mag Morgan's Morgantown. <laughs> a recent study released showed that nearly 60% of West Virginia renters are at risk for eviction, making us one of the highest risk states in America. What is being done to protect those renters and what can we do here in the state to protect them as well? Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Matthew, the US House uh, well over three months ago passed what they call the HEROES Act, which not only would prevent evictions, maintain the moratorium on evictions, but would help uh, people uh, be able to pay their rent. Um, and that is precisely what we're trying to do in the Senate. Uh, what we're trying to do now is to say, sorry, you can't throw people out of their apartments or their homes. But in addition to that, because people are unemployed, they don't have the money. We're trying to help people be able to pay their rent. So it's a two-pronged approach. Uh, but as Matthew um, uh, tells us, this is a enormously uh, serious problem all across this country. Uh, people should not be thrown out of their homes. Uh, I mean, it is just unspeakable. So we have got to demand, again, that the U.S. Senate act and act right now in protecting working people. Rusty, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, he's 100% spot on. Senator Sanders was spot on there. Um, I would like to, if it's okay, touch on um, one of the questions that you, you guys just answered and um, pertaining to our addiction epidemic here in West Virginia. Um, I'm a firm believer that all of this, when it, when we're talking about addiction, it, it goes back to the economics. Um, you know, I, I feel like the root cause of addiction for most people um, is trauma, and that trauma could come from living, in, you know, living in poverty. There's there's multiple different ways that you know people can experience trauma, but I feel like our our elected representatives, especially here in West Virginia, when it comes to looking at the issue of addiction, the first uh, their first inclination is to jump towards punitive measures. And Mr. Boyd hit the nail squarely on the head when he said that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is uh, connection. And when we punish addicts and treat them like criminals rather than patients, you know, the way we should look at them, we're furthering the disconnect. And I feel like the way that we are approaching um, solving this problem, we're actually making it worse. So, you know, to me, we have got to start treating people suffering through addiction um, like like human beings rather than, you know, we, we can't, we can't throw away people just because we're mad at, them, you know? Um, and, and I feel like, and until we shift the way we look at this issue, nothing is going to get better. Um, we need to be looking into harm reduction initiatives and that could be, you know, long-term recovery, of course, that is needle exchanges, um, safe injection sites, things of that nature. We do know we've got the data that shows that states that allow patients to access whole plant medical cannabis see a, a reduction of 25% in um, opioid related deaths and overdoses the first year of implementation. So there's, there's multiple um, avenues we can take to address addiction, but these punitive measures of just locking people up and calling them criminals because they are suffering through addiction um, is only making things worse. Let me jump in and, and ask, a, Misty, I'm gonna ask a question if that's all right. Mm -hmm. um, for a number of years, quite unbelievably, the United States of America uh, has actually seen a decline in life expectancy. 
changed a little bit, I think, in the last year. But for a number of years, people in America, despite improvements in medical medicine uh, and prescription drugs, et cetera, people were living shorter lives. And states like West Virginia, Kentucky, have been part of that decline in life expectancy. And what the doctors say is that the reason for this decline is what they call diseases of despair. Diseases of despair, meaning people are turning to alcohol, people are turning to drugs, and in some cases, even suicide. I think, Rusty, you touched on, but what is going on that people are, are turning to drugs, to alcohol, to even suicide? What, what is going on in people's lives that result in, in those decisions? Who wants to jump in on that one? I, I mean, I'm this. Great, I'm sorry. I have a, you know, I, I feel like when, when people are struggling to keep the lights on, when your entire life, um, you know, you're, you're just, you're doing everything you can, you're working every day as hard as you can just to maintain the very basics of, of human needs. It's natural reaction to reach out to anything that makes you feel better. Um, for some people, that's, uh, that's a bottle of alcohol. For some people, it's cannabis. For some people, it's prescription drugs. For some people, it's gambling. Some people, it's food. Um, you know, addiction, when we talk about addiction in West Virginia, I think it's, um, we're doing ourselves a disservice when we only talk about the opioid epidemic because we've led the country when it comes to tobacco use, when it comes to binge drinking and alcohol abuse. West Virginians um, have been suffering for a long time. And I, I it still goes back to the economics to, for me. Um, even when, you know, we're a coal producing state, that's what we're known for. But even when our coal production, when, met when metallurgical coal production was at peak value, West Virginia citizens still teetered between 47th and 49th economically. Um, so all of the, um, the natural resources that are literally right under our feet, they get extracted by these out-of-state companies and you know the profit goes right out of state with them. And I'm a firm believer that until we address that, until we start electing folks who are willing to prioritize people over the bottom line um, profit margins of these out-of-state corporations, we're never going to address the, uh, the addiction epidemic here. And in fact, every year when we cut taxes for coal companies and we cut taxes for uh, natural gas companies, we're, we're in fact making our addiction problem worse. And uh, you know, I've, uh, you hit the nail on the head with diseases of despair. And in West Virginia, poverty is that despair. Poverty is traumatic. You know, it, it's, it's not easy to live um, in poverty. And, and unfortunately, West Virginia, we, we have a state full of people who are suffering every day. And also it's environmental, um, Senator. And also because we've broken our workers, you know that coal mining is one of the hardest professions in America to go and deep in a coal mine. It's been proven it's one of the hardest professions that you could have. And a lot of our coal miners um, were sent to the local clinics and they were, they got addicted because they were broken. And uh, we see all across the state, it's not only in coal mining communities through my travels, even out in communities like Weirton, where they had Weirton Steel. Those people feel forgotten. They live in impoverished conditions comparable to people in the coal fields. And um, it's all over the state. Um, it's not just McDowell County that leaves and, you know, that leads impoverished conditions. We have people all over the state that uh, are living in horrible, horrible conditions. Um, and, and it's even in the rural areas, it's not even comparable to in the cities. If you go into these rural areas, um, you know, that's what they live in. But in a city, they would tear it down. And uh that's just the thing. And people are so disconnected, I think. I've heard from so many people across the state that they feel so oppressed. They feel so unheard. Out in the eastern panhandle and the northern panhandle, they're four and five, four and five hours away from our capital. And um, it's even hard to reach uh, the people that are supposed to represent them there and also in Washington, D.C. And uh, you were one of the senators came here and actually sit down with me as a coal miner's daughter. But for us to be heard, oftentimes we have to get arrested for even, even for our incumbents to hear us. 
And so that's the big problem. There's a disconnect. It's it's not, there's no war between us. It's a war between us and our and their so-called representatives. Like I said before, we've been treated like collateral damage. How many times can you cry and say, I'm suffering before you either fight back or you give up? And so many people in this state feel so oppressed and so downtrodden because they don't have anything. People say, if you don't like it, move. How can they move when they don't know where their next meal is going to come from? Right. I'd like to add something too to that, Bernie. It's, yes, it's, it's generational here. So when I say generational, we have people who live, and I'll just talk about Charleston because that's that's where I'm at, that's where I'm stationed just right now. But we have people who live in, let's say, Section A housing, and they, they grew up in Section A housing. Well, they know that if they don't make so much money, and if they don't do this, and if they don't, they know that hell right here in Section 8 housing. You know what I mean? And, and I'm thankful that we have that and we do, but they get used to that. So they don't try. There's a lot of people who who get used to seeing like their or 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 my children alone. They see me working three and four jobs at a time, and I work with the people. I work, you know, in social services. I was a CPS worker. I still had to have two jobs, three jobs. I was running the 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 domestic shelter in Charleston, the only one in Kanawha County. I still had to wait tables. I mean, there's uh, and and it's nothing about my employers. My employers are great. There's nothing about that. It's just, they just, I mean, they just don't have the money to do. There's nothing else to do. I see, I see that happen way more than it should. Instead of a, a kid moving out from with their parents, they take over at 18, their section eight and their parents move to a, a, a disability place instead. And now they're just handed off onto section eight and they'll get comfortable like that. We have to start teaching we have to show them that there is more and we have to teach them that there is more we have to start at the children or we're never going to get anywhere and they see the pet they see the drugs they see the abuse they see the people struggling for food they see people at this we have a, a food pantry that right now we have people we have 27 percent more people coming to our food pantry but people got all these all these food stamps and all this stuff that was supposed to be extra. But they, you know what I mean? Because they don't have, they don't know how to budget it. They don't know how to do the things that they're supposed to do because they're not taught. And they weren't taught from their parents and they weren't taught from their parents. Somebody has to step in. A social worker at school would be great. You know, if we could get that funded to have the one social worker at two, four, three or four schools would be wonderful. But we don't have that right now. And there's a, such an undue burden on our educators right now, especially with talking about opening up our schools because of the addiction and the poverty and everything else that's going on with their state. Our educators have not only acted as educators, but they've also fed our children and acted as counselors and parents to the children that they're trying to teach in their classrooms because it's so hard here. And now we're talking about opening up our schools in the middle of a pandemic when we're not allowed to conjugate no more than 25 people in a public park. And uh, it, it, that's just the thing. It's just like the people in the Appalachian region, we're not victims, but we seem to be forgotten. We're not victims because we stand up and we take care of each other. And we've always, you know, if we're hungry, we feed each other. Um, you know, somebody's in trouble, one of us are in trouble, all of us are in trouble, despite what our partisan politics are. But when it comes to a government that serves us, we feel forgotten and we feel underserved, especially especially after we've sacrificed so much to power this country. Um, and that's why we're fighting back is because we are tired of it being underserved and we just want a government that will serve us and take care of us and treat us with the dignity and respect that we deserve as proud Appalachians. Well, maybe on that note, Ms. Thea, I think we can um, thank uh, Paula Jean uh, for helping to organize this and for running a great campaign. And we need people like Paula Jean in the Senate uh, who come from the working class, who have not forgotten where they come from and are prepared to fight for workers. Uh, and I want to thank all the other the panelists, uh, uh, James and Rusty and, and Cassie, for not only for being with us, but for the great work that they're doing every day. It's not easy. All of you are engaged in really tough stuff. So um, with that, uh, let me thank again Paula Jean and um, thank all of you for uh, who are viewing 
of the live stream and uh, look forward to being with you again in the not too distant future. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Senator.